It all started with the name. We wrote down a list of names, and Atari was the third on the list. And I looked at it and said, it's okay. <laughs> that developed into a legacy. Well, when you think about video games, Atari is the worst. Atari. Atari was the first and the boldest, the most broadly disseminated game name that was ever done. At times, they were unstoppable. And there's a Pong on the ferry boat. Oh my God, it's everywhere. Like, oh God, what have I done? And there were times filled with turmoil. E.T. was not a good idea. The game was programmed in six weeks, and as you probably know, most of them wound up in the landfill. And there was lots of partying. Woo! Coke sort of came into vogue right about that time, and so it went through Atari as well. This is the unbelievable true story of the rise and fall wow. of the most famous video game company in the world. It's the story of... In the late 60s, an unknown industry begins to evolve. Engineer Ralph Baer receives the first video game patent for his version of video table tennis and develops the first home video gaming system, the Brown Box. Ralph Baer started peddling his game in around 1970. Couldn't find a buyer, went to RCA, went to Zenith, and it took a few years before Magnavox picked it up. Bear signs a contract with Magnavox, and the system is renamed the Odyssey. Magnavox and Sanders, which was the company that Ralph Bear worked for, were showing off the game, their new product. This is in January 1972. And Nolan Bushnell went to see this product, and he signed the guest book that he was there, and he saw the Magnavox Odyssey, and he wasn't impressed with it. Nolan Bushnell, a University of Utah graduate and engineer, moves out to California and hooks up with friend Ted Dabney. And if you're going to be an electrical engineer, and it's the late 60s, early 70s, you're going to be in Silicon Valley, in the center of the action. And with $250 from a savings account, they form their first company. It's called Syzygy. Suzuji, Sujiji, Syzygy. No one could pronounce it. In 1971, technology isn't exactly peaking. One of the first uses of the computer video screen. Somebody programmed a game called Space War. But Syzygy still manages to develop their very first coin-operated video game called Computer Space. Computer Space was the first game, and what I was trying to do was really bring Space War to a cost point. Computer Space is a commercial failure. And in 1972, Nolan Bushnell changes the name of his company. We wrote down a list of names, and I remember that Atari was the third on the list. And I looked at it, and I said, well, it's OK. <laughs> Atari starts development on their second video game, one with a very simple concept. As we know, computer space did not do well. It was too complex for people at that time. So he wanted to come out with a simpler game. So he challenged me to do a ping pong game. I told him I wanted to go. A very simple, one moving spot, like the Magnavox Odyssey. I suspect he'd seen the Magnavox Odyssey. Knew it wasn't a very good game the way Magnavox had it done, but it was could be nothing could be simpler. And what can be more simpler than a ball bouncing and two paddles hitting it. And the title is just like the game. We named Pong just because you couldn't own a ping pong game, and so we just truncated it and called it Pong. Well, Nolan, that's the G. Well, let's put it in the box. And we put it with a coin mech on the side of the box, very simple. I went to Walgreens, got a black and white TV, made a monitor out of it, and put it in the Andy Capps Tavern, one of our locations, over the weekend to see what would happen. And the rest is history. It took off. But before Atari can begin celebrating, they're slapped with a lawsuit. Magnavox went around showing this toy before they put it on the market in very um, closed sessions. And Nolan Bushnell attended one of those closed sessions and beat everyone to market by by a few months with Pong. So Magnavox sued 
Atari and Nolan Bushnell. And they proved that Nolan Bushnell was at this meeting in Burlingame, California. And he did sign his book and his guest book. And he did see a video game of table tennis before it came out. So they settled out of court. And what they settled for, I think, was Atari got the rights to video games for $100,000. That was it. And then they made a killing after that. Pong becomes a nationwide phenomenon. Soon after, Ted Dabney decides to move on and sells his share of the company to Bushnell. Although copycats are popping up everywhere, by the end of 1972, Atari still reports earnings of $3.2 million, thanks to the success of Pong. And Nolan Bushnell moves forward with another idea. But then it came time to do Consumer Pong. And uh, everyone says, well, you know, it was, boy, what a great idea. So I figured, okay, I'll do consumer pong. I'll show them. We'll see how far we get with this thing. We'll bankrupt the company. Because, I mean, how are we going to do? We had to, how could we launch a consumer product with nothing? We had no backing, no equity, no. He's crazy. So I remember the day we got the consumer chip to work. And it was like, it felt like a dog chasing a car. You caught it. Now what do you do with it? Well, you try and sell it. So we called Chicago, Sears Tower, cold call, and got uh, Tom Quinn, the buyer, the right guy, and he was there in three days, and thank God for Tom Quinn, and we, had, we were in the consumer business. Sears signs on as an exclusive distributor for Home Pong, and it flies off the shelves. Atari reaches $40 million in sales, $3 million in profits, and Pong is out of control, selling more than 150,000 units. Atari owns the video game industry with their home version of Pong, but competition, wild parties, and Bushnell's departure will soon become a major part of this company's history. With Atari's release of the home version of Pong, the young company is making millions and having a blast while doing so. We had this camaraderie that it was us young guys, and remember, this was just after the 60s, so the age of Aquarius, don't trust anyone over 30. People came to work whenever they wanted, and they picked what topic they were going to do games on. People would sit around, literally get stoned, and start brainstorming ideas for games and things like that. It was very much a part of the creative process. So they pretty much were doing what they wanted, okay? And it worked because these games were labors of love for a lot of the programmers. MRB was a marijuana review board, and that was like our open code for, okay, let's go get high. It was also a time where we didn't worry that much about legal liability. You know, getting drunk and going home and, you know, I mean, almost everybody went home with everybody else. Sexual harassment or things like that wasn't an issue. As time went on and as more and more money came into the environment, the class and quality of the drugs tended to increase substantially. Coke sort of came into vogue right about that time anyway. And so it went through Atari as well. Experiencing a cash flow problem for the upcoming Christmas season, Nolan sells Atari to Warner Communications in 1976 for $28 million. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that when you have a successful company, that a, a growing company is actually consumes cash. You can very seldom throw off cash fast enough to grow as fast as you want to. So it was either take the company public or sell it to somebody with really deep pocket. When Warner bought us in late 1976, uh, I couldn't believe it. And all of a sudden, there was real money in the bank. Wow, this actually did work. But now that Atari has sold its soul to Warner, things inside the company begin to drastically change. When uh, Warner Communications took over, all of a sudden it became this big corporation. This is the way you're going to work. You have to wear suits. You have to come at this time. You have to leave at this time. Atari, under Nolan Bushnell, its motto was innovative leisure. <laughs> under Warner, it was, we're the Atari VCS company. And that's a big difference. With a change in atmosphere, Atari goes on to develop Stella, a prototype console that accepts cartridges. It's Atari's response to Fairchild's programmable Channel F home video game system. So there were a lot of arcade games out there, particularly Atari arcade games. And uh, what they wanted to do, one of their marketing strategies was, let's take these successful arcade games into the home and sell home versions. What Atari had that the other companies didn't have was this stock of arcade titles that they were able to use. 
1977, Atari releases the BCS, later to be renamed the 2600, with a retail price of $200 and a library of nine games. So we introduced it, and you could just feel it in the air. The product was so revolutionary, everybody knew it. It felt great. Atari enjoys strong sales in 1978 and a fantastic holiday season and releases more games like Outlaw, Space War, and the fan favorite, Breakout. Breakout. There'll be a new wall come up. I'll break out that entire wall, a new wall comes up. And you can just keep playing into infinity. Internally, however, Atari is at odds. And the man that formed the company decides to leave. There were so many vulnerabilities that the company had. And, and it seemed like nobody at Warner was aware of them. And I felt that if they were bound and determined to go down these foolish roads, then I didn't want to, to do it. New CEO Ray Kassar moves in, but not with open arms. Meanwhile, several programmers are getting fed up with the lack of credit for their games and the management of Mr. Kassar. When we asked for credit for it, we were turned down pretty flatly. In fact, we were told that we were no important to that process than the person on the assembly line who put them together. You had several companies that were willing to give credit for the games, and better still, they were willing to pay royalties on the games. Guys like David Crane and Al Miller, who were creating games and they were selling millions of copies, and they were seeing, they were getting, collecting the salary, and they couldn't even get their names on the games. So four guys make a decision that will change the video game industry forever. There were four of us at Atari who worked together. We went to lunch together. We were just a little group of four guys. And we just sitting at lunch one day said, you know, we could do this. We, why don't we design our video games and market them ourselves? And um, it wasn't all that easy, of course, but thus Activision was born. This is Pitfall, the smash hit. The smash hit video game by Activision that... Activision becomes the first third-party software developer for the 2600 and releases such hits as Pitfall and Fishing Derby. Get it before they're all gone. Pitfall, designed by David Crane. Atari goes on to release two more great games for the 2600. Space Invaders and Asteroids. Atari licensed Space Invaders from uh, Tato in 1980 for the uh, VCS. And this was the first game ever to be licensed from another company. And that was just a huge hit for Atari. That's what basically sold the BCS. Then, of course, Asteroids, that was probably their second big hit, again, based on the arcade game. When it comes to space games, nobody compares to Atari. By 1982, the video game industry becomes a horse race between the 2600 in television and Coleco. You'll see amazing graphics. Like this. Atari releases Pac-Man and E.T. for the VCS, two incredibly hyped games which are critical flops as well as commercial failures. The video game that lets you help E.T. get home. E.T. was not a good idea. And it got to the point where Atari's attitude was, we put anything out, it's going to sell. Great, send I don't know how many million dollars to Spielberg for the name. What? And, you know, and now we had to go make a title out of it. The game was programmed in six weeks. Atari had lost a lot of the skills and the people. All the really good guys were over at Activision. Somehow that cartridge got built. It just didn't play well. They manufactured more copies of E.T. than there were Atari 2600 in existence. Not a good idea. And as you probably know, most of them wound up in a landfill. Pac-Man is probably considered one of the worst games of all time, uh, E.T. No disrespect to Howard Warsaw or developed them, but they were terrible games. Atari, needing cash, re-releases the 2600, but the masses aren't buying it. With a string of bad decisions, Atari finds itself in a tailspin. Al Alcorn is gone, and stock in Warner drops 33%. The whole ambience of Atari changed, and very rapidly. I mean, they began selling off divisions. Their computers didn't sell. But things at Atari are only getting worse. I didn't know. Miss Pac-Man? This Miz plays only on the Atari 5200 Super System. And now... In 1982, Atari introduces the 5200 to the gaming public. Now you're talking. And it bombs. Atari came out with the 5200, which was really developed as a competition for Intellivision. Look at Atari basketball. 
And in television. I think in television plays much more like real basketball. If you think ColecoVision plays all Atari cartridges... By the time it was released, it was competition for the ColecoVision. And we bring the arcade experience home. But I think the ColecoVision games were better. They looked truer to the real games. Of course, the, when the 2600's lifespan ran out and they had to go to the 5200, the American consumer went, wait a minute, uh, I've had the same record player for 25 years, for the same television set for 25 years. Why are you suddenly telling me now that after like four years, five years, I've got to trade in this game system for a whole new game system? It was a very difficult concept to get across. Christmas 83 sees a glut of inferior games, and 600 Atari employees are laid off. But the scrappy company's not giving up just yet. In 1984, they announced the release of the 7800 and promised more 2600 games with improved graphics and sound. Unfortunately, the improved 2600 games are never released, and Atari ends up selling their home video game division to former Commodore CEO Jack Tramiel. Jack Tramiel, actually, he ruined Atari. He wanted to make Atari a computer company, no more games. The 7800 was announced but never released. The warehouses were full of them, but he wanted nothing to do with them. Atari, power without the price. In 1985, Nintendo shows up, and Atari misses a huge opportunity. When Nintendo came out with the NES, they were afraid of Atari because Atari had global dominance. Atari meant video games at the time. So they approached Atari to give Atari the rights to uh, the NES outside Japan. Atari didn't take it. Then Nintendo took over. So Atari decides, well, we have all this warehouse full of 2600s, 1700s. Let's sell them. Discover a world beyond your wildest dreams. So their heart really wasn't in, into games. They just had the games, let's try to make some money on it. The release of the 7800 is sloppy. Few stores carry it, and the system fails. In 1988, Atari makes a shocking decision and rehires Bushnell with hopes that using his name will increase sales. Well, you know, remember, I was just a consultant. I just did a couple of projects for him, and uh, I, had a, I had a creative team. and and. In some ways, Atari was so over at the time, you know, in terms of, of being on the cutting edge, that uh, it was nostalgic, but it was not rewarding. I like Link. The screen is bigger. I like Link. More can play at the same time. In 1989, Atari goes head to head with Nintendo once again and releases the Lynx, their first portable video game system, against Nintendo's Game Boy. The Lynx is more expensive and heavier. And Nintendo ends up the holiday winner. 1991 marks the last year Atari will see a solid profit from operations. Nintendo reinvented the world. Nintendo showed that people still wanted entertainment, they still wanted fun, and they still wanted games. But Atari isn't giving up. They released the Jaguar, a system with a CD-ROM attachment, pro controller, and some marquee titles like Primal Rage and NBA Jam Tournament. But it's too little, too late. They announced they will merge with hardware manufacturer JTS and discontinue supporting the Jaguar. Atari Jaguar. Suddenly, nothing else seems fun anymore. Hasbro Interactive bought Atari for $5 million. It was the beginning of the retro craze. They started releasing all the old Atari games, but in updated versions of it. And unfortunately, they didn't do a good job. In 2001, French-owned Infogroms purchases Hasbro Interactive, obtaining the Atari name in the process. Atari means so much to people who grew up in that age. Atari is video games. You see the Atari logo, it means something. The younger people today who might buy an Atari game, it's just a name on a box. They have no idea what, what it means. Regardless of where Atari is today, people around the world will always remember it for what it was and what it began. Oh, I think it was wonderful. My experiences with Atari were one of the greatest times of my life. 
because the people were fun, the challenges were fun. We did not take ourselves that seriously. We played games with other people, other industries. And no matter what terms these guys left on, they are all proud to have worked at Atari. Well, when you think about video games, Atari is the word, it's the name. Atari was the first and the boldest, the most broadly disseminated game name that was ever done. And you never know what the future will hold. Now, Infogrames taking the Atari name, and I think they're disassociating it from the entire catalog they have, and they're releasing brand new games with the Atari logo, which is nice that Atari is now a new company again, which is what it was in the beginning.